Welcome to the Effortless English Show with the world's number one English teacher, A.J. Hogue, where A.J.'s more than 40 million students worldwide finally learn English once and for all without the boring textbooks, classrooms, and grammar drills. Here's A.J. with a quick piece to help you learn to speak fluent English effortlessly. Hi, I'm A.J. Hogue, the author of Effortless English. Learn to speak English like a native. Go to EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Join my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Join today. Today, live on Facebook for our book club show, live Effortless English show, live on Facebook, of course, recordings are always added to the podcast. You can always watch my past videos, the recordings of the videos. They're all on my blog, EffortlessEnglishClub.com blog. Okay. Let's see how many people are joining. Are people joining? They are joining. We have good morning. Hello, Claudia. Thumbs up. Hello, hello. We got people joining. How many people are joining? Yep, we got people joining. Good. Fantastic. Shall we start? I think we should start. Let's go forward and get started. Fernanda is here. Fantastic. Good morning from Brazil. How are you? I'm doing very well. Thank you. Good evening. Just getting dark now here in Japan. Osaka, Japan. Talking to you from Osaka, Japan. Raimundo, also from Brazil. Vietnam. Suher, good morning. Lots of good mornings. So lots of Brazilians. Brazil, 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 Brazil. Holy. All right. How are you? I'm doing fine. Cliffy's here on our very active Air Force English family members on Twitter also. Ronan, hello. Good morning. And we also have Iraq, Ukraine, Vietnam, of course, Vietnam, Paris, excellent, Egypt, Bangkok, Thailand, Kruntep. Fantastic. Let's start, shall we? Today we're doing chapter two of Dumbing Us Down. Same writer, John Taylor Gatto. Same topic, schooling, education. And uh, you're, you're going to see, I've noticed this with John Taylor Gatto, the, he brings back a lot of his main ideas. Oh, each chapter he brings back his main ideas, and he, but he just says them differently, which is a good communication technique because... Um, you know, when you say something, sometimes you persuade or you educate some people. But maybe your style of communication is not effective, is not good for everybody. So then if you say the same thing differently, then other people understand it better, right? So it's changing the communication style helps with persuasion. It's a good persuasion technique. And he's using that in his book. Uh, we got Morocco, Malaysia, Somalia, Russia, and lots from Brazil. Fantastic. Okay, guys, let's start, shall we? We'll come back. Uh, Greece, Italia, wonderful. Myanmar, wonderful. Looks like a monk in Myanmar. Fantastic. Even better. Good morning from ah, Italia, a couple from Italy. Myanmar also, Afghanistan, Laos. Lots of countries, Mongolia, Slovakia. Uh, more from uh, Yangon, which is Myanmar, Hungary, Kurdistan, all kinds of countries. Many, many. Malaysia. Great. All right, guys, let's start, shall we? I'll come back. As you know, if you're watching live now, questions and comments will come later. Let's just get through this second chapter. Let me teach you the second chapter. Reading glasses on. Let's begin. Chapter two. The title of chapter two is The Psychopathic School. <laughs> You'll notice something about John Taylor Gatto. Uh, how should I say it? He's not subtle. Not subtle. Do you know this word subtle? Eh, subtle is a little hard to, uh, to uh, spell. It has a strange spelling, subtle, because it has a B, but we don't pronounce the B. So, so it, subtle is, it's actually spelled subtle. It's spelled S-U-B, S-U-B, like boy, buh, 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 S-U-B-T-L-E, T-L-E, S-U-B-T-L-E. It looks like subtle, but that's not, that's wrong pronunciation. The correct pronunciation is subtle, 
subtle. The B is silent. Silent B. So subtle. What is subtle? Subtle means um, kind of careful. It means you, you're not too strong with what you're saying. Not too strong communicating. Right? Not too direct. Subtle means kind of indirect. Not too direct. Not very direct. Subtle. John Taylor Gatto is not subtle. <laughs> it means he's super direct and very strong with his language. His vocabulary choice, the words he uses, his style of writing, it's very, very strong and very, very direct, which I like because I, I'm that way too with Effortless English, especially in my podcast. I'm sure you've noticed with my audio podcast, I can be fairly direct and strong about some things. But I like that. I like direct communication is clear. The problem with subtlety, subtlety is the noun, subtlety. The problem with being too subtle, the adjective, the problem with being too subtle is that sometimes it's confusing. You're not being direct, right? So if you're too subtle, on one hand, it feels more polite sometimes. But uh, the problem with subtlety or being subtle is that it's not clear. It's less clear communication. So I like John Taylor Gatto. He's not subtle. He's very strong, very direct. So you, you know exactly what he thinks. You understand exactly what he says because he's very, very direct and clear about it. So this title, The Psychopathic School, psychopathic is an adjective. The noun psychopath, a psychopath is like a serial killer, like somebody who kills people. That <laughs> means somebody who, 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 who doesn't care about good or evil. So he's saying that schools are like this, that schools, the systems, they don't care about good or evil. They're psychopathic. So again, very, very direct and strong communication. So again, um, he says, we live in a time of great school crisis. That We have a very big school crisis and we have a social crisis. So he's saying we're living in a time globally, everywhere in the world, where we have a social crisis. Families are falling apart, getting weaker and weaker. Societies, right? countries, societies, cultures are getting weaker and weaker and having all kinds of problems. This is definitely true in the United States. Uh, we're seeing drugs, drug addiction is a, is a big, big problem around the world. Many, many, many problems. Uh, suicide with teenagers. Lots of kids now in schools giving they give them drugs for many different things, right? I'm talking about legal drugs, like the like drug companies, doctors giving kids drugs because they're t too much energy or they won't focus enough in school, so they give them drugs. This is a crisis. There's a big crisis. And he says we have lost our identity. We've lost our identity. We have lost our community. We have lost our community. It's like your neighborhoods, your neighbors, your connection to your neighbors, your connection to your culture, your connection to other human beings you, that you live near. That's your community. He says, we've lost that connection. And then he says, children and old people are pinned up and locked away from the business of the world more than any time in history. What does this mean? Pinned up means like locked up. He's saying basically that what we do, he's American, so he's, he's talking about America, but this is happening in a lot of places in the world where children are separated away from everybody else, right? That's what school is. You take the children and you separate them from parents, separate them from other adults, separate them from their older brothers and sisters, separate them from their cousins, separate them from their younger brothers and sisters and cousins and family, separate them from the world of work, separate them from their home, and then put them in a class with other kids exactly the same age. So they're separated away and kind of locked in rooms together, everybody exactly the same age. And then he mentions that this, we do the same thing to old people, right? When people get old enough 
especially I know they do this in America. They they take the old people and they put them in what they call retirement homes or nursing home. Same idea. Take them away from the young people. Take them away from their homes and families. Put them in a place only with other old people. They're not around children anymore. They're not around middle-aged people anymore. Just They're just put away, like kind of locked away, like a prison for old people. He's right, right? And that this, this is unusual. If you look at all of human history, you know, that we know, and, and then going back, we can use archaeology, anthropology, even guessing farther back in human history, this is very unusual to separate children from everybody else for so long and to separate old people from everybody else from so long for so long is also very unusual and it's not healthy he's saying it's not good this is unhealthy for our societies then he mentioned something else that schools are not good at schooling he says He's, he's, ta he's told us a lot of the problems with schools, but he said, what's amazing is that schools are not even good at doing their first job. Right? Their first job should be teaching, right? So science class should teach science, right? In science class, you should learn to be a scientist. In uh, English class, you should learn to be a writer or a poet. In art class, you should learn to be an artist. In uh, business school, you should learn to be a successful business person, Right? seems right that's logical but he says in fact no one believes this anymore we all know this is not true he says no one believes anymore no one believes that scientists are trained in science classes politicians are not trained in civics class poets and writers are not trained in english classes the truth is that schools don't really teach anything except how to obey orders the main thing that schools teach is how to obey orders, to be obedient to the teacher, to the school system. But they're, they're, all their other things they're supposed to do, they're not good at it. Then he says the institution, this means uh, the system, not individuals. But the system, overall, the system of schooling is psychopathic. It has no conscience. It means it has no idea of good or evil doesn't care about good or evil, doesn't care about right or wrong, doesn't care about love. It's psychopathic. Now, he's not saying individual teachers. Of course, there are some very wonderful individual teachers. I'm guessing he was a wonderful individual teacher. He worked in this system. That's why he's criticizing it so much. He worked in the system for a long time. I'm sure he obviously cares deeply about kids. So it's not about individual teachers. It's about the overall system. Okay, then uh, he's, he divides this in sections. So we've got section two next. Section two, he's, he gives a little history. He's talking about American history again of, of, of school. He says the compulsory schooling is an invention of the state of Massachusetts around 1850. Okay, so in the United States, the first time they had um, compulsory. Here's a new vocabulary word, compulsory. Compulsory means you, uh, no choice. You're forced to do it. You must do it. You cannot say no. That's compulsory. So compulsory school means required school. It's not voluntary. You cannot say no, right? That's what we have in most places now in the world. The children cannot say no. If the children say, I don't want to go to school, it doesn't matter. They have to go to school. They're forced to by the government. So he said, this system in America started in 1850, which really is not, it's, you know, that's not super old for all of human history. That's not very old, 1850. And it started in one state, Massachusetts. Is the st it's in the northeast part of America. Yeah, this, the most famous city is Boston. So started in the northeast. We call them Yankees up there, Yankees. It started in Yankee land up in the Northeast in 1850. This is before the American Civil War, just before. He said it was resisted. It was not popular when they did this, sometimes with guns. So in other words, at that time, when they tried to force 
families to send children to schools. It was not popular, and many people fought against it. And sometimes they fought against it with guns. They would shoot at the school teachers and the school officials who tried to take their kids and put them in schools. So, See, those Americans in the past were a little tougher than they are now. And he said it, it, for the next 30 years, there was a lot of fighting about it. And, it was, and then finally in the 1880s, they used the army. The state used the army to force everybody to send their children to school. They used the army. <laughs> they would send the army to, out to people's houses and, with guns and force them to send their children to school. This is how this system of education started in America. I, other countries, I don't know. He doesn't talk about it. But you can see, right, something kind of evil going on. They're using guns to take children from their parents. That's the history of this system of education. Now, here's another statistic about, specifically, again, he's talking about America because he's American. He says, before this system, before 1850, the literacy rate, that means the reading rate, was 98% in America. And after they used this system, it dropped to 91%, which, which is about what it is now. It actually got worse when before the system of forced schools, forcing them to go, more people could read a higher percentage in America, 98%, when they were all just doing homeschooling and voluntary schooling and, you know, lots of different kinds, actually. 98% of Americans could read, could read well. After they, the compulsory school, the forced school, it actually dropped by 7%. It dropped down to 91%. It got worse. School made the reading level worse, not better. Isn't that interesting? Then he makes another statement. He talks about homeschooling. And now, more recently, how homeschooling is growing in America. It's growing very fast in America. It's very strong in America now, homeschooling. And he says that children schooled at home, meaning home education, children who don't go to school, they learn at home with, with one parent or maybe one, more than one parent, they are five or even ten years ahead of children in schools the same age. So they're far, far, far ahead. That's more than I thought, actually. Homeschooling kids, average, right? Most, are far, far ahead of school children of the same age. Amazing. Okay, then he talks about uh, a little more about uh, the, the school systems we have now and that it was designed to be like a factory, right? The, the main purpose of the school systems that we have now is to control human behavior, to make everybody predictable and controlled so that people would obey, everybody would become the same. That's the main thing. Everybody would become the same. Everybody would get the same beliefs, the same ideas, follow the same rules. They would become easier to control. That's what the school systems are really for. That's their true purpose. <laughs> then again, like I said, this he, he's a strong, he says strong things. He says, well-schooled people are irrelevant. That means people who are trained really well in schools, they're not important. They're not meaningful. He says, they can sell they can sell razor blades. They can do office work. They can talk on telephones. They can watch a computer. But as human beings, they are useless. As human, as full human beings, they are useless. Because they're miserable. Because they have no meaning in their lives. Because they can't think independently. All right, on to section four now of this chapter. 
So this is chapter two, but section four. And this is one I've this is he actually he talks about a topic that I have been talking about in my audio podcast a lot. My audio podcast. He says two systems, two institutions control our children's lives. So two main things control our children's lives. Number one, television. Number two, schools. So he's saying our children's lives, their time, is controlled by two things, television and schools, TV and schools. And then he does some math. He's like, imagine, and okay, in one week, there are 168 hours. Is that right? Seven times. Out of 168 hours in each week, so seven times four. Yeah, all right. 168 hours in a week. He says, minus 56. So imagine your child sleeps 56 hours every week. That's eight hours a day. Some sleep more. But 168 hours total in one week, seven days, uh, 56 hours they have to sleep. So now they have 112 hours, right? Awake. They have 112 hours per week when they're awake, your children. He says, according to recent reports, recent research reports, children watch 55 hours of television a week, which is a, a lot. The average child in America watches 55 hours of TV a week. He says, then that leaves only 57 hours a week. Only 57 are left, right? After sleeping and TV. Then children go to school 30 hours a week. Sometimes more. But let's say 30. Plus they have to get ready for school. They have to travel to school on the bus or train or car. They have to do homework. So he's like, let's increase that to about 45 hours a week total for school. During the time at school, they have no freedom, zero freedom at school. Somebody is watching them all the time. They have no privacy. They have no freedom. He says, so after, he says, that leaves only 12 hours a week of free time. Right? If you minus TV, minus sleep, and minus all the time going to school, at school, coming home from school, and doing homework, only 12 hours a week for family time. Plus they have to eat, right? Plus they have to eat. So he says when you subtract all of this, the, your, the parents, the family is only getting maybe 9, 10 hours a week of focused time with their children. That's much less than the school time. That's much less than the TV time. So he's making the point that the TV and the schools are the real parents. It's really the TV and the schools are training your children how to think, not you. You think you are as the parent, but you're not. You're much less important than the TV and the schools. That's the average. Now, hopefully you are different, but he's saying for the average family, this is the truth. That's sad. He's right. I those numbers might be different for each family. Of course, they're different individually but overall his general idea is correct so he's saying what we're doing from with school is we're taking away children's time we're taking away all their free time we're taking away their freedom we're taking away their time taking away their time to explore the world taking away their time to play taking taking away their time to be curious Taking away their time to have privacy. Taking their, away their time to explore and try things and experiment. And he says the result of this, the result of this, he said that it's the same as last chapter. He says children become indifferent. They're disconnected from the adult world. They have no connection to the adult world. I remember this myself growing up. I, I had no idea what my dad did. I knew he had a job. I knew, the I knew he had, 
the company he worked for. I knew he, I knew the name of the company, but I never, I never had any idea what he actually did each day. I had no idea what his job was. Zero. I still don't know, really. So I, I had zero connection to my dad and the adult world. None. It's very unnatural. It's very strange, actually, if you think about it. But this is true for most children. They really have no idea about the adult world. They're kept away from the adult world, separate from the adult world, right? Everything for them is just the kids' world. There's kids' TV. There's the kids' world. All they're in school, it's just other children, mostly, right? So they, they learn to not care about the adult world. They learn to, to not have any connection to adults. They lose their curiosity. They don't think about the future. They don't have any connect. They have no connection to the past. They don't have connection to their ancestors, for example, their grandparents, their great grandparents, the history of their family. He says, because of schools, children are cruel to each other. This means they're mean. They're really, really terrible to each other. You know this. Children can be terribly, terribly, terribly mean and cruel and really, really mean to other children. Because the, in the school environment, they are just in a group of other kids their same age, right? There's one teacher. The teacher can't watch everything all the time. They try, but they can't. And so in that kind of environment, when they're locked in together, it becomes like a Lord of the Flies. Ever read that book? Uh, basically, it's like a prison mentality, and the strong become the rulers, the bullies, and the weak and the soft and the kind become the victims. And everybody in the middle just tries to kind of uh, be normal, or follow the rules, and avoid the bullies. So I, I can remember this growing up, you know, that the, some children were bullied so, so, so terribly. Really, really terrible. They were so unhappy. Just because they were different somehow, right? A little bit different in some way. He's, he's right. They can be very, very cruel. He says, the, te the, te the children I teach in schools, uh, they feel uncomfortable with intimacy. This means um, intimacy. Intimacy means like emotional closeness, emotional honesty. Right. It means like, for example, if 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 uh, you were to have like a really serious talk about a serious topic, an emotional topic where you would um, maybe you feel sad or maybe whatever, you know, and you just really honestly open up and talk about your emotions in an honest way, not pretend to be cool. He's right. Most kids, especially uh, like teenage kids in uh, America, they, they got to pretend to be cool and they're very uncomfortable if they have to talk about something emotional. Uh, they, they pretend like they don't care and they're cool and they, they're afraid of that. They're afraid of that true honesty. He says school teaches them to be materialistic where they value money and things and grades instead of being good, being a good person, being happy. And of course they learn to be passive. It's because most of their time is taken from by school and TV. School and TV are teaching these things. School and TV are the cause, causes. Okay, so there's the depressing first four sections. <laughs> I mean, like I said, he's, he's not subtle, he's direct, he's very, very honest, and he shows us how horrible the situation really is in schools. Now, nicely, in section six here, still in chapter two, but he's section six, he starts focusing on solutions. What can be done? How can we change this? How can we improve this? What can be done? What are some possibilities? He doesn't give us one answer. He just gives us several possible answers. His first one that he says is the best one, it has the best opportunity, the best potential, is homeschooling. And he says homeschooling is already very, very successful in the United States. He's correct. Homeschooling is big in America. It's becoming very popular now. The last few years, 
um, it has become super, super popular, homeschooling. So that's number one. He says, "How? what's the best way to teach in, in homeschooling? Or he says, there's the other possibilities or something like you could do, um, uh, like a, you could have private schools, you could have uh, like uh, family schools or, or gr like community schools. Maybe a few families get together and they share homeschooling. So instead of just one family doing it, maybe you have two or three, maybe in your family or in your neighborhood, whatever, friends. And you all work together. So it's kind of a group homeschool. It's another choice you could try. But he said the best way for people to learn, for children to learn at any age, so you too as an adult, is to, he says, put, place the child alone, alone somewhere, with a problem to solve. He says the best form of learning is self-education. It's just trying to figure stuff out. So he says don't instead of just telling the answer all the time, right? Just saying this is the answer, this is the answer, this is the answer. The best thing to do first with children is to just let them try to figure something out themselves first. Let them be curious. So if they're trying to learn some math problem, let them try to figure it out themselves first. Now, maybe they will, maybe they won't. But the best form of learning to activate their brain, help them become more intelligent, is for them to try to solve problems themselves first. And let them do it alone. Let them just work on things alone for a while. If they want to read, let them read things. Just let them sit down and read quietly about something without you telling, 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 telling. He says, trust children from a very early age with independent study. Independent study is the very best way of learning. Independent study. And you can trust your children, even young children, to do independent study. Of course, as they get older, they become more and more and more independent. And of course, as the parent or as the adult... You are their coach. You will be helping them, right? If they if they try, 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 and they can't, they need help. Then of course you will come and help them sometimes. And of course you're going to be the leader, especially with young kids. But he's like, you you always, always, always want to teach them independent learning. You want to train them to think for themselves. You want to train them to be motivated to learn. You want to train them to always be curious and to try to solve problems themselves. These are great skills for life. Another key thing, another great form of education. He says you need to connect children with the real world as fast as possible. That part of learning, it's not just reading books and doing math problems. You want them to do things in the real world, right? He's like, so for example, you could have them go to dad or mom's work. And follow them around work for a few days. Maybe even try to help a little bit. Connect them to the real world. Or they could, when they're older, like teenagers, they could maybe try to go do a little internship or volunteer at different types of jobs to learn about them, to see what they're really like. Or they could do volunteer projects. There's lots of things they could do, but out in the real world. Or they could build things at home. Or they could try to start their own business, even at a young age. Lots and lots and lots of possibilities in the real world, not just book learning. Important. All right, now we go on to the next section. Okay, so then he gives us kind of a list of things in general, kind of what makes the best education. Number one, independent study. He mentioned this. Community service. So do things in the community. Get the kids doing things in the community. Maybe they're just volunteering sometimes to do some things in the community. But get them outside the house. Get them out away from the school where they're out in the world doing things. Maybe they're exploring things. Maybe they're, you know, watching birds. Whatever it is, get them out in the real world. Uh, 
They need adventures and experience. So they need to just explore things and explore new things. They need a lot of privacy and time alone. This is interesting. So a lot of learning is privacy and time alone. They need to be able to go in their room or go outdoors or wherever and just sit down and read a book without being bothered, without anybody telling them that they must do an assignment and they must write a report. No, they just, just give them plenty of time to just sit down and read a book that they like. And in general, he says, family should be the main engine of education. So family is the center of education, not school. Family. It's family-centered education. The family is the center of the education. The family, they're the masters of the education. That's where the education happens. It's in the family. So he calls this the curriculum of the family. This is the heart of any good life. The heart of any good life. So he's like, you know, the other thing about this is that in the family education, it's not just reading and math and, you know, school subjects. It's also, you know, how, how to live, right? It's useful things like cooking. That's a useful skill. Well, they, they should learn that. That's part of a family education. Good communication skills. How do you solve arguments in a good way? How do you live with other people when you have lots of disagreements? Well, that's fa all families have to do that. So that's also part of their education. And you, and you teach that to the children. It's part of home education. Your uh, religion, very important. Your family history, your, your full extended family, all the values and things that are important to your family. Feeling that connection and belonging to family, also very important. Part of, that's part of education too. I think, you know, like we talked about with our last book, money. How, how to deal with money, how to become financially free, how to be the master of money and not the slave of money. I think that's a very important topic for family education. Again, they'll not, they're never going to learn that in school. Schools will never teach that. So he's saying, see, this, this is why family is the center. Family is the most important. And then the last sentence, he says, it's time for a return to democracy, individuality, and family. And that's the end of our chapter. All right. So some repeated ideas from last chapter, for sure. And a few new ones. Interessante, interesting. Interesting, interesting. And as always, very strong, very clear and strong. Okay. As usual, I'll go to comments and questions now. And then if we have time, I'll do a li another little uh, lesson about something different. We'll talk about American football because football season started. The University of Georgia Bulldogs season started yesterday. They won their first game. Woohoo! Go dogs. All right, but first I'll let our live viewers. We've got a lot more live viewers now. People have joined in the middle. Time for you to comment or ask questions, live viewers. And then if we have time, we'll do some American football, some more American football, college football. Okay, let me look through this list. Uh, well, this is a very practical question, so I'll answer it. Hello, AJ. Where can I see the schedule of your live videos, your live streams? Uh, nowhere. Well, Twitter. <laughs> but basically, I do them on Saturdays usually. Today is late. I'm a day late today. Usually it's Saturday night, Saturday evening, kind of early night in Japan time. That's Japan time. I'm in Japan right now. So Japan time, Saturday evening is usually when I do these live videos. The exact time, eh, there's not an exact time. It's when I'm ready. The best thing you can do is follow me on Gab or Twitter 
So it's gab, G-A-B dot A-I, gab dot A-I. Follow me there. My AJ Hogue is my uh, account, AJ Hogue. Twitter is the same thing, AJ Hogue. So just follow me and then I'll, I announce before I go live. I'll say, okay, I'm going live in 30 minutes and I'll put it on Gab or Twitter. So that's the best way to do it. But usually it's Saturdays. Today, I'm a day late today. Got busy yesterday. Good morning from Switzerland. Hello, hello. Arthur from Poland. Thank you. Philippines, lots of people sing. Just going through the hellos again. Vietnam's Independence Day. Oh, congratulations. All right. Okay, let me get past the hellos here and see if I can find some questions and comments. Arafat says, using your best system, I can now talk in English. Fantastic, and congratulations to you. I appreciate you sharing your success. Thank you. Okay. Uh -huh. Okay, let's see. Um... Nabil from Morocco says, I followed you I followed you since 2014. That's great. I learned a lot from you and your method. It's amazing. Your method make, made me able to learn more from people like Tony Robbins' book, Ray Dalio. He's an investor. Elon Musk, most of you know him. And now Lee Kuan Yew with his amazing book, From Third World to First. Singapore, I believe, right? He brought Singapore to, uh, into, to well, right at the top, right? To one of the... Strongest Economies in the World. Also a pretty amazing story. I, I should read that book. That sounds great, actually. Well, thank you, Nabil. That's great. And that is, of course, it's one of my goals to help you to do that. So you learn from me. And of course, in my podcast, I try to give you all these great ideas and introduce you to interesting people, interesting books, interesting ideas. And I hope that you will then go read them yourself. If you're not ready yet, if your English level is not good enough yet, then you can join my one of my courses, Power English, the VIP program, and then your as your level gets higher, my hope is you will do exactly that. You'll go read uh, these books, you'll listen to those other podcasts too, TV shows, movies, and you'll get all these more and more and more and more and more great ideas from lots of great people, lots of great thinkers out there. Good. Oh, Subala says, is it true, sir, they used armies to force to send children to school. Yes, it's true. They did it. Massachusetts, USA. Sad, huh? They still do it today. They, 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 they still do it today. It's Nothing's changed. Now the army's called the police. Okay, but it's the same thing. It's people with guns, right? And they call them, in America, they have these special officers. They call them truant officers. But it basically means that if your kid doesn't go to school, if your child doesn't go to school for many days, then they send somebody to investigate, right? Knock on your door. And if they find out, oh, you, you're, you, you're not going to go to school, then they will send officers, right? These are government agents out to force your kid to go to school unless you homeschool. And America now. Now in America, the homeschooling laws are different. America's confusing sometimes because every state has its own laws about some things, and education is one of those things. So each state has a slightly different rules for homeschooling. Homeschooling is legal in every state in America. You can do homeschooling everywhere, but sometimes you have to like send a report to the government. Right? Sometimes you have to tell the school system, and sometimes you don't. It just depends on which state you live in. And this is also true in other countries. So, you know, it's legal in Japan. It's legal in Thailand. I know because I lived in both those countries, so I know it's legal in both those places. Someone on Twitter just told me it's legal in Italy. But, you know, in each of these countries, they're going to have different rules. So you have to find the rules for where you live. But... This idea of people with guns forcing children to go to school, it still happens. Uh, 
Ozma says, unfortunately, it's true. All day, children watching TV. It's sad, and it is, it is, it's true. I mean, because he's talking about averages, right? Hopefully, your child's not doing that, but you know, the, every year they do. The, I see these statistics, you know, every year, every year, every year, every year about the number of hours people watch TV and children watch TV. Usually, it's the United States I'm looking at, but it's always very high. It always shocks me, actually. And Eileen says, you're right. Now, the television and the computer are now children's parents. Yeah, and the schools. TV, computer, and schools. Right. I mean, internet, right? When we say TV, when he was writing it, maybe internet was, this book is a little bit old, so he doesn't mention the internet, but video, basically. Video. Sad. It is sad. It's super sad. All right. Hello, hello, Mexico. Hello, hello, Libya. Lots of more countries. <laughs> Sukar is having problems with internet. I waited for this live show for four days, and then when it came, my internet was gone. <laughs> oh no! My internet seems to be working. I think it might be on your side because mine seems like it's fine. Okay, that's another comment. Let's see. Uh, I'm a PhD working as an archaeologist. I studied English for 18 years, but in a year with AJ, I made greater success. Soviet schools did not teach English. Looks like you might have a Ukrainian flag there. We crammed rules that could not even be understood. Now I listen to AJ for one to two hours and understand more than 90%. Thank you, Master of the and the wonderful idea of effortless English. Well, thank you so much. That's a great, that's a great story. Yeah, wow. I mean, right? 18 years in schools and then still can't really speak. And then after just one year of effortless English, already improve more. It's so sad to me, right? And this is, uh, just imagine if we had this, you know, home education or just, just lots of different choices for education even that, it's not only English. In all areas, we could have so much better education. So much better. Okay, Nasser again, one of our first English family. Uh, let's see. I am Nasser. Yes. Uh, thank you for the audiobook gift. I appreciate it. Good. I'm glad you're enjoying my audiobook. A lot of people... After school and university, hate to learn anything else. I know. All they do is sit around passively doing nothing. Why? Well, why is, I think it's clear to me why. Because they're bored. They're bored and they're tired. So they go to school. And you're talking about university, but it's, or even high school, whatever. They go there. They're forced to be there hours and hours. And then they're also forced to do homework. So they come home and they've got to do even more. And this is boring and it makes them tired, mentally tired, right? To do all that work that they don't like, that's boring, that's artificial, they're not interested in so much. So, and then they connect this to learning. They think this is learning. It's not. It's schooling. It's not learning. But they're... When they're finished with all of that, after six or seven hours of that one day, when they're finally finished with that, they don't want to do it anymore, right? Because they think, oh, I don't want to, I don't want to learn anymore. Oh, I'm already tired and bored with learning. I just, want to, I just want to do nothing. I just want to watch TV. I just want to play video games. I just want to party. I, just want, to, I want to do turn off my brain. Tired. That's why. That's why. I, I mean, that's... It's it's bad. It's terrible. But that that's the reason why I understand why. Um, it's sad. I mean, this is one of the bad effects of school. And the, the problem is then what happens is they go and they'll get a job, like a full time job when they graduate. And then the same process happens again. They go to work and they're doing stuff that maybe they're bored with, or maybe they're just tired at work. 
and then they come home after work and then the same exact thing happens again oh i'm tired right my brain's tired i don't i don't want to i don't want to read a book i don't want to study something i don't want to learn something i'm tired i just want to watch tv watch a movie drink a beer whatever and so the pattern starts so then lifelong, they're just not learning very much. I mean, some things, maybe at work, they have to learn some things, but most of their learning stops, right? Most of their curiosity dies. Their independent learning mostly dies. It's sad. Now, the good side of this is that people who become independent learners, I mean, you, you're independent learners. That's why you're doing effortless English. The opposite happens. You begin to wake up. Your brain comes alive again. Your curiosity comes back, or maybe it never left. And then you continue learning all of your life. You're a lifelong learner. So you're an adult. You're still learning, right? You're still learning right now. And in this way, this is why, you know, just imagine your whole long life. You're learning, 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 constantly learning your whole life. And in this way, you improve, you improve, you improve. So that's the good news. And I talk about this in today's audio podcast. I haven't uploaded it yet. I will. Um, but this is good news for you, for anybody who had problems in school, anybody who was behind, anybody who felt stupid in school, who had bad grades, bad tests. I'm, this is good news for you. Okay. That doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Okay, it doesn't matter if you went through, it doesn't matter if you went to school and then maybe in the middle of high school, you were, you were a bad student, bad student, right? You didn't do well and you, you drop out, you quit, you quit high school. You, you never graduate high school. You quit school at 16 and you feel stupid and oh, right, because you got this label. Well, if you do nothing, if you stop learning, of course, probably that is a bad situation for you. You have limited choices. However, here's the good side. I'm going to give you some good news, guys. Because even in that situation, if you become an independent learner, even if you dropped out of high school, but if you keep learning, just keep reading and learning, even if you're way behind everybody else, at 16, you're behind. You're five years behind everybody else. But here's the thing. Most people around 18 or 20 or something, just like Nasser's saying, they just kind of turn off the brain. They do what they must do at school, but they don't be, they're not independent learners. Most of their independent learning just slows down and stops. But even if you drop out of school at 16, oh, it looks hopeless. Oh, I have no high school degree. I don't have a college degree. Oh, I'm stupid. Oh, I can't read well. My reading sucks. Oh, my math's not very good. Oh my God, life sucks. I'm going to be terrible, right? Wrong. Just keep doing it. Just keep going. Don't quit. Don't quit. Don't quit. Just read. Continue to read things you like. Just be curious and read about only things you like. Only things you like. Only interesting things. That might be fiction. It might be nonfiction. Doesn't matter. And then just try to learn anything you're interested in. Maybe it's fixing cars. I don't know. Maybe it's traveling somewhere. It doesn't matter. It could be art. It could be, you know, history or what. It doesn't matter. Just keep learning. Okay. Just trust me. Just keep learning when you're 16 and then 17. Keep learning. Just be curious about the world and keep learning. 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23. Maybe you have some bad jobs during those years. Probably. Probably you have some low paid jobs. Maybe you don't make much money. Keep learning. Keep learning. Keep learning. Keep learning. I'll tell you what will happen. You're going to catch up and you're going to pass almost everybody else. All those people who get the college degrees, even the ones that get the master's degrees like me, or the PhDs even, most, not all, you're going to catch them as long as you just keep learning. You're five years behind. It doesn't matter. Keep reading. Keep reading. It will improve. Just read what you love. Keep doing it. Keep doing it. Don't stop. Don't stop. Continue to learn your whole life. Eventually, you catch most people, and then you pass most people because they stop and you don't. And then guess what happens? Oh, now you're 35, and you've continued to learn. You never stopped. Now, your understanding of the world, now your skills, the skills you have, the knowledge you have, your ability to learn is now far past most people. 
And this is when the magic begins. Maybe you start your own business. Maybe you go back to school and then you, and you get your college degree or your ma- and your master's degree or whatever. Whatever you do, but you catch up and then you're past most people and then you keep going and you never, never stop. Okay, it's not the end. It's not the end. Even if you drop out of school, even if all your grades are terrible, even if every test score is terrible, you cannot get into college. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's not the end. Keep reading. Keep learning. Stay curious. Keep going. It's a marathon. It's a marathon. The others might be faster than you now, but you're going to pass them eventually. You're going to keep learning and keep learning and you're never going to stop for your whole life. That's the power. That's the power of independent learning, of not stopping. It's super powerful. Very hopeful. That's why I say grades, uh, who cares, okay? It's very short term, those grades. Nobody after, uh, nobody, after I graduated from school, college, right? I left, even, even grad school. Nobody asked me about my grades. Not one time did anyone say, oh, how many A's did you get? What was your grade point average? What was your score on the SAT? Nobody asked that. They don't care. Okay, not for one job was I asked that. Not one time did they talk about that. Not one time did they talk about my school at all, in fact. <laughs> Nothing. They didn't look at what classes I took. They had no idea. They didn't care. Nobody cares in the real world. It's about results. What can you do? What do you know? What results will you get? And that's about learning, 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 learning. Not the stupid grades, okay? So just relax about the grades. Especially if you have problems in school. And, and this is also for you parents. If your child is struggling, the main thing is to teach them to love learning, to love reading, to be curious about the world, to keep going. Lifelong learning. This is the main thing you must teach them. Okay? You must get this idea into their head. If they have this idea, they'll be fine. Okay? They'll be fine even if they struggle in school in some things, even if their test scores are not great. None of that matters. What matters the most, they're independent learners for life. That's the number one gift to give them as a parent. Focus on that. Okay, let's keep going. Okay, um, Sivak says, all requirements that children need for learning can be fulfilled by different means. Yes. How can it be possible to teach science subjects like uh, physics, chemistry, biology at home without equipment? Oh, I think pretty easily. Let's, let's look at each of these. Physics requires, uh, I'm just going to think back to my, I'm t- I, I assume you're talking about high school level. First of all, most of the high school science, at least in the United States, there's not much lab, okay? Lab, what you're talking about is labs, right? The actual mixing of chemicals and the laboratory assignments. Cutting open a frog or something in biology, right? Those are labs. The other side is just the, the learning, the ideas. I mean, when I was in school, I'd say 95% was the learning, the ideas and the formulas and the labs. I mean, honestly, the high school labs were pretty useless. I, I don't think... I don't think I really learned anything in them. You're not doing real experimental science in most high schools. That usually is happening more at the college level, at least in America. I don't know about it. You're, you're from India, I think. So I, I, I don't know about India, but in the United States, high school labs are kind of a joke. You can just skip them. You don't need them. So that's number one, okay? You don't need to do the experiments yourself to understand physics or chemistry or biology. However, number two, if you do want, if you want to teach these things, it's not that hard. Physics is really easy. It's, it's pretty easy to do basic classical physics experiments. You can do a few of them. When it's not that hard. Uh, biology, also pretty easy. Uh, I know in America, you could probably order, you know, a, a dead frog <laughs> online and uh, have it delivered to your house in ice and cut it open. If you want to, you could do that. I, don't, I, I think that would actually be pretty easy and, and very cheap. And you just need a, a scalpel, like a, a, a cutting knife, uh, also easy. Um, you could buy a, you know, little microscopes if you want to look at um, like bacteria.
bacteria and things in water and that kind of stuff. Again, you know, now you can order those things on the internet quite cheap, very cheap. So biology, pretty easy. Chemistry, hmm, probably there you could do a good number of chemistry experiments fairly cheaply too. I remember as a kid, I had a little kid's chemistry set. It was this, came in this box and had all these little chemicals and you could, I mean, I don't know, just for kids, you can mix up stuff. So again, I don't think you would really need to spend much money. I think you could actually make a little science lab pretty cheaply and pretty easily, quite easily, uh, ordering stuff online. I'll let you know because I might, I might do this myself. Now, this is really, you're waiting to do this stuff at high school level, uh, I would think. But um, yeah, I'll do, tell you what, I'll do some research about that. I, I'm, I am almost, I'm probably 95% certain that doing these labs would be quite simple, actually, and, and cheap too. Uh, from Heartland, hey, AJ, I love your pronunciation and methods. Thank you. Well, thank you. That's nice. Uh, great question from Chin here, Tron. Uh, come on, show it. Okay, here we go. How about online education systems? Well, exactly. If you're listening to my audio podcast, and you should because I do an audio show every day, Effortless English podcast every single day, audio, I have been talking about this exact subject. So for homeschooling, there are many choices. This is why I like homeschooling. One of the reasons I like homeschooling. One, it makes families stronger. Two, it's better education. But three, there's so many choices. You have many ways to do it, okay? Very many ways you can do it. And this, one of the simpler ways, a very easy way, is online uh, homeschooling systems where basically they give you everything. They give you all the lessons, all the topics, all the textbooks. I don't like textbooks myself, but if you want to use them, okay. Um and you basically, your, your child just gets online, they log in, and they just follow the lessons online. They watch the video lessons. They do the activities on the computer. Everything's online. As the parent, it's really easy. You're kind of just there to, be, to answer questions and uh, help them a little bit. But mo all the material is, is in the online program. So these are really good systems for people who want to, are not sure, maybe parents that are, I'm not sure what to do. I don't know how, how would I do it? Um, th maybe the confidence is low for the parents. Just do, uh, do some research. There are many. I talked about on the uh, podcast, they're, they're not expensive. There are many, very, very, very uh, low cost online programs, all ages, you know, from kindergarten to advanced high school. And their complete curriculum, meaning their complete study for all subjects and everything. And they're really good. There are many really, really good ones. Not expensive. Super easy to use. They're also offline systems. The offline, it's the same idea as the online, but the only difference, the one difference, they just mail everything to you. So instead, of, it's not on the computer, it's actual books, like physical books with papers and, you know, worksheets and assignments and everything. So you get a big box of stuff and your child, again, just got, follows it, you know, lesson one, lesson two, lesson three. But again, it's a, it's a super organized system and you just pay for it and you get everything. So yes, I, I think those are good systems for many families. I, I'm, you know, I'm going, I will do a much more loose system myself. I, I don't need that, but I think some people feel more comfortable with that and that's totally fine. So yes, I recommend that. It's much better than schools. Okay. A uh, common question, how do parents have enough time to teach children why they have to go to work? Well, basically one parent needs to, um, either not work or only work part-time. It can be done with one parent working uh, part-time. So what you would do is, uh, let's say mom. Dad goes to work. Dad's working full-time. Mom works part-time. Let's say mom gets an afternoon job. So her morning is free. So in the morning, mom homeschools the children, teaches the children. 
in the afternoon, children go to daycare, children go to a family member's house, whatever you decide. And then mom goes to uh, work for her part-time job in the afternoon. That's one solution. I think the better solution is one parent stays home all day, which means maybe you have to live more cheaply. So time to follow those Robert Kiyosaki um, ideas and the ideas I gave you about cutting your expenses. I think that's the main thing you do is one person works and one, one parent works and one does not. That means you might have to cut your expenses. You might have to move to a smaller, cheaper place. It can be done. I promise you, it can be done. Big hug from Brazil. Thank you, Fritz. Ah, another great one. Thank you very much. Thanks to you, I started talking to English speakers after three months of practice. Fantastic, man. That's fantastic. Wow, three months. Thanks for sharing that. I appreciate it. Sharing your uh, success, really great. Wow. Okay, Lika has a very common question, so I'm going to uh, answer this one. Let me get a little water. Okay, question. I, re I read English books every day, but the thing is I still forget uh, new words. Why is it happening? It's totally normal. Don't just relax, Lika. It's Why is it happening? It's happening because you need repetition. One time's not enough. So imagine you're reading a book. Well, just like now, you you just learned compulsory, right? You learned compulsory from this uh, book, chapter 2. I just taught you compulsory. Maybe you forgot it already. What does it mean? Can you remember? Eh, you might have forgotten it. That would be normal to forget it because you only heard it a few times. Maybe I said it three times or something during uh, today's video. Eh, three times probably is not enough. You, there's different research I've seen. Everybody has a different number. There's not an exact number, of course, but uh, often I see numbers such as 30. You need to hear a word, a new word, or read a new word about 30 times until you really understand it and can use it, sometimes more. So, if you, you're reading a book and you see a new word once or twice or three times and you forget, and you forget two times, you forget three times, just relax because that is 100% normal. It's nothing to worry about. Just keep reading because you will see it again eventually. Eventually, you're going to get enough repetitions. Just, just enjoy your reading and the repetition will happen. No need to worry about that. Okay, GM Himamali, what are the reasons that children do not go to school in the USA? Uh, reason number one is homeschooling, for sure. Homeschooling is very big. It's growing fast. It's already fairly big in America, and it's becoming, it's in, becoming much more popular now, really starting to grow quite a lot. That's number one reason. I mean, other than that, then you've just got things like uh, reasons like, uh, I don't know, the kids don't like school, <laughs> I guess. <laughs> they hate school. They don't want to go. So they, they don't. They, they skip school. This is mostly at older ages, right? High school age. I used to do this <laughs> when I was in high school. I was bored, bored, bored out of my mind, and I... I had a car at that time or my I would borrow my parents' car to drive to school. And uh, but I, I would get so bored. And so sometimes I would skip school. I'd pretend to go to school, take the car, but then I would go somewhere else. <laughs> Not I'd skip for the day. Uh, or sometimes I would leave early or go late. So I, I I imagine that's probably one of the big reasons because I hate it. Hey, hey, look at this. Lena says, hello from Ukraine. Homeschool rules. We are listening to you now with my nine-year-old son. He sends his regards. Hey, fantastic. Say hello to him. Hello to you, both of you. Ah, oh, that's great. 
See? Learning English already. Quite amazing. Quite amazing. Normally school is compulsory. Right. But as I said, um, uh, this is Hamali with a follow-up question. Normally school is compulsory in America. It is, but you can home... It, if you homeschool, then the rules are different. And homeschooling is legal in America. Can they force, as Sukar says, can they force to send teachers to school? No, nope, they bribe them with paychecks. <laughs> if they don't come, they get fired and they don't, they get no money. That's how they, uh, that's not really force, right? Hello from Sudan. Hey there, Salah. Yeah, now this is a good question. I mean, good comment from Min. In school sometimes when some friends are, are, you know, they're more good than others, sometimes they have, it's hard for them to have friends. This is exactly right. This is, again, that prison mindset, attitude that can happen in schools. It's very common in schools where it's not cool to be smart. It's not cool to be good. It's not cool, right? Cool meaning good to be um, self-disciplined to be intelligent. Like that's, that seen like it's almost bad, uh, which is terrible. I mean, I understand why, but it can be bad, especially for the smart kids can actually suffer. They get bullied because they're so smart. It's a terrible situation. And it's another advantage of homeschooling. It doesn't happen at home. Santosh. Okay, this is a good question. I have, a, I have a, an interesting answer to this question. Santosh Kumar says, One of my younger brothers wants to be part of the Indian cricket team. If you don't know, cr cricket is a game. Sport. He's pursuing the 10th class right now, but next year he's planning to leave academic study. Is it a good idea? Maybe. I don't know your brother situation, but I, I think it's a good idea. I'll, say, I'll tell you why I think maybe it is a good idea. It's a good idea because your brother is choosing his life. It's a good idea because your brother has a goal and he's going to go for it. And he's, he, if he wants to succeed, he's going to have to work very, very hard to do this. He's trying to get to the top of Indian cricket. Cricket is very serious in India, I know, which means there are a lot of great players. To get to that level, not easy. So, uh, you know, good for him for doing, I'd say good for him for doing this. Here's why. I know some people will say, oh, no, it's bad. You should graduate from school. But I'm going to, you know, mention again what I said earlier. This Forget this idea that there's an end. Okay, your brother can go back. Your, the main thing is your brother continues to learn. So let's say he quits school. He focuses on doing cricket. How many years does he have? I don't know, what, what, three possibly? Three, four years, really, to succeed or fail, right? To, to, at that level, because if, if, if he's too old, they're not going to take him. If he's too old, it's too late, right? So if he is not getting to the top of cricket by the time he's 20, 22, he's probably not going to make it. Okay, imagine he does that. He tries hard, he works, he, he has to be super self-disciplined to become a professional athlete, okay? This is the top of the top of the top he's trying to achieve. He's going to have to be super self-disciplined, super focused, super motivated, and he works and he works and he works, and he, and, but he, he fails. Maybe he just physically, he's just not good enough. I mean, this happens, okay? This is life sometimes. Does that mean it was a mistake? I don't think so. Because he developed so much mental toughness, so much mental discipline, working so hard. To, he's developed to work hard and he trusted himself and he made a decision, a tough decision. So guess what happens? Now he's 22 and he has to do something new, right? He can't do cricket. He's finished. But he has these great skills. It's not too late. 22 is still quite young. If he wants to go to school and do something academic, like with his mind, he can... As long as he keeps reading, he can just keep studying, keep reading, keep studying. He can go back to school. He could study. He could join online programs. 
He could get uh, do the GED test. That's the high school test for Americans, for high school. I don't know if India has something like that. He could do an online university at age 22. Okay, so he graduates from college kind of late. He could graduate from, you know, get his college, I mean, his high school diploma or certificate. Yeah, he does it late, but he can still do it. Maybe he decides to become a cricket coach. I don't know. Maybe he decides to become a motivational speaker. Maybe, maybe he decides to start his own business, right? He, as long as he doesn't quit, as long as he has the mindset, keep learning, keep learning, keep learning, keep going, keep trying, keep learning, he'll be fine. That's the key point. The danger is, the danger point, of course, is if he goes, he tries to be a cricket player, he fails, and then he just becomes depressed and quits. Oh, I, I failed my one goal, and now I'm just, I have, no I have no high school degree, I have no college degree, my life's over. If he, if he has that mentality, of course, that's terrible. But if he just keeps the mentality of, he uses that self-discipline, and he just has to change it. He tries cricket, he does not succeed. He uses the same self-discipline, now he uses it for study. Or now he uses it to start a business, or whatever else he wants to do. Maybe he wants to become a monk or a sadhu. I don't know, right? It's a, it's, but as long as he keeps the, 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 de, the discipline and the decision-making and all of these great things, he'll be fine. Just keep learning. Don't stop learning. He'll be fine. That's my feeling about it. That's what I would say to him. And that's my opinion about it. So there you go. Good luck to him. And, you know, the other side is he might succeed. He might be playing for the Indian cricket team someday. And isn't, wouldn't that be great? Uh, John says, thank you very much. I'm using, listening to your YouTube videos. Great. Hmm. Can you talk about, okay, this is Ozma again. Can you talk about income skills such as copywriting, consulting, digital marketing? Uh, yeah, I'll write those down as topics for the pod. Probably those will be podcast topics, audio podcast. Uh, yep, yeah, okay, Carol. Hey, Carol, good to see you again. Uh, makes a really good point. Making children stop watch to stop watch TV is the role and responsibility of parents and no one else. True. Real education is provided at home, but parents must be ready to spend time with their children. Yes. Sometimes they, the parents, are the ones stuck in front of the TV. Isn't that true? I mean, those same studies that, you know, they do studies that children watch seven hours of TV a day. Well, they do studies about adults, too, and it's the same amount of time or more. So the, uh, the average American adult watches seven or eight or nine hours of TV per day. Where do you think the kids learn this? They see mom and dad doing the same thing, uh, right? And, or, or they're all watching together at the same time, <laughs> right? Yeah, as the parent, you're the leader. And you're the leader in two ways. Number one, like Carol says, it's just your, it's, it's your responsibility. You just tell them no. Turn it off. Walk over and turn it off. Unplug it or throw it away, whatever you want to do. But, you know, you're the, you're the leader. And the second thing is the other way you are a leader is that your kids watch everything you do. They watch you and they copy you. Uh, we just... Uh, my, my little niece was over here, visited us this week. And I, yeah, I realized she was watching everything I did <laughs> and copying me everything I did. Like I would think I could, for example, I had some chocolate, right? I wanted to eat some chocolate, but I didn't want her to have it. She's, she's really young. She's like two years old. So I don't, uh, she's not supposed to eat. Her mom didn't want her to eat it. But I wanted to eat the chocolate. So I thought, okay, well, I'll, 
you know, I'll, I'll secretly eat the chocolate when she's not watching. So I kind of went and I thought, ah, oh, now is the time. And I went and I hit it. I put it up high where she couldn't get it. I went up and I got it really quickly. And I was opening the little package and it made a little noise. And she looked, her little eyes looked. And he's like, what are you doing? And I'm like, ah, right? <laughs> little, they're so quick. They watch everything you do. So a great way for them not to watch a lot of TV is you don't watch too much TV. If you want your child to be a good reader, one of the best ways is for them to see you reading. Right? Sit down and read a book at the same time with them. Of course, read to them when they're young, but when they're older, let's say middle school age or something, you could have a family reading time. No TV. That's all just sit down and read. And they see that you're doing it too. You're doing it with them. And, you know, they watch, they learn by watching you too. Good points, Carol. Hello, Sam Barak. Um, can we get the text of the podcast? We will do this eventually. I'm working on it. We, we have a few technical improvements to our VIP program as uh, first project, next project, we're going to work on doing this. Okay. Okay, this is a good point by Sukar. Sukar says, Sukar, whose icon is Julia Roberts, I believe. Okay, schools focus on materials, topics, that will be neglected in the future because they aren't the real world things we need in our job life or financial life. Just they make us spend these years learning nothing useful or real. Right, this is, this is exactly what Gato's saying. We always learn from real life, not from school, the things we need and we'll still keep learning in schools. It's a bad system for life. Yeah, I agree, a hundred percent. Isn't it strange? I mean, think about this. Let's just let's just imagine if you're an adult or even a teenager. I think you already know. What are the like the big important things in your life? The big areas of your life that will make you happy or sad, uh, give you a good life or a not good life. What are the like really? When you th really think of it, one way you can do this, by the way, go look in a bookstore or a library, and look in the self-help area, self-help books, and what are the topics? What are the topics people are trying to learn to help themselves so they have a, a better life? Right? It, it's, it's, not, it's not American history. <laughs> okay? What is it? One, relationships. That's probably number one. Love, relationships, marriage. This could also include parenting even friendships, relationships, big, 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 good relation. You have a lot of great relationships in your life. You probably have a good life. You're probably quite happy. Your relationships are, are terrible. You don't have many relationships. You're lonely. You have bad relationships. You're probably unhappy. It doesn't matter how much money you have. It doesn't matter if you're good at chemistry. If your relationships are bad, you're probably not very happy. Your life probably not so great. Two, communication. This is part of relationships, but it may be a bigger topic even. So communication in, re in your personal relationships, but then also you know, kind of business type communication, right? Marketing, sales, public speaking, because these have a very strong effect on your career, your job, your financial life. Again, not taught in school. Relationships, definitely not taught in school at all. Communication skills, not taught in school. These are two of the most important things. Three, we talked about last time, last book. Money, money, money's huge. We all have to use money. You might like money, you might hate money, but you can't avoid it. We all have to use money. We have to figure out money, How this money system. Right? And if 
you're unhappy, if, if money controls you, if you feel like you never have enough money, if you feel like you're a slave to money and have to work terrible jobs that you hate because of money, again, your life is probably not so great. On the other hand, if you're financially free, you probably have a happier life. It's a better life for most people to be financially free. Money, again, not taught in school. What's another one? Huge one, super important, health. Health and fitness, big, 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 very important, especially as you get older. Super important. If you are unhealthy and not fit, again, you're much more likely to be unhappy, to have a life that you are not enjoying, to be in pain, to be tired, to have low energy, to be depressed. On the other hand, if you're feeling healthy, you got tons of energy, you're strong, you feel great, you're more likely to have a much better life. Are you taught to be healthy and fit in school? Again, no. You see the pattern. These are the major things of life. Meaning. What about meaning? Philosophy of life. Religion. God. Whatever words you want to use. Right? The, the big meaning of our life. Not taught in school. We can keep going. You can look at every, choose the, the areas of life that are the super important for happiness, for a good life, uh, for an enjoyable life, for more freedom. This is not what schools focus on. None of these things. None of them. That's kind of sad. It's, it's a little strange, isn't it? When you think about it. Compared to those things, you know, Chemistry and calculus are not so important. They're not very important for most people. I mean, it's nice to learn those things. And certainly if you want to be a scientist, yes. But if we don't learn those important things, this other stuff doesn't matter so much. So good, 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 good point. And Nasser gives a nice summary here. John Taylor Gatso, Gatto knows how the school systems are terrible. He wants us to understand that by taking our kids out of that environment, help them to change their character so they begin to learn independently and become lifelong learners, lifelong curiosity. Yes, good summary. Well done. Okay. Hasina says, I've learned so much from books. Reading books is the best independent education. It is. It's so easy. It's, this is, it's really, I don't know, easy. What well, is easy? It's easy and it's simple. Most of independent education at all ages is just reading books. Most of it. Some of it's practicing skills. But a, I, most of it is just reading. You can learn so much just by reading books. That's, that's why I, I really think reading is the master skill that must be taught. And it, luckily, it's easy to teach. And that once the kids learn it at a, at a fairly young age, that's why they can become independent learners so easily. It's so simple. Read books, read books, read books. Okay, I think it's, we're kind of long today, already an hour and a half. I also did an audio podcast, so I think I'll do the football show another time, Georgia football. Let's see if I got any more comments here then. We'll just stay on this topic. Uh, Sosa says, uh, what should I do after I finish studying? Should I study something else or look for a good job? Because I haven't found a job yet. Why not both? Keep learning. Keep learning. Remember, learning is lifelong. You need to think of this. Get it out of your mind that you stop, that you stop learning. Get the, this is a bad belief. Get rid of this belief that there's some point you graduate and now you're finished learning. You're never finished. Okay, it doesn't matter. When you're working a job, you still continue to learn. When you're not working a job, you continue to learn. When you're traveling, you continue to learn. You're always learning. 
You're always learning your whole life. So it's not a it's not a choice one or the other. Do I work or do I learn? No. You're you're always learning. You work and you learn. You take a break and you still learn. Ah, cool comment here from Monica. Hey, Jay, you're my inspiration. I teach adults. Many times I hear I will never learn English because I was bad at school. Right? I know. I hear it too. I give them an example of my friend. She was 65, 65 years old, went to Italy. And after a year, she speaks fantastic Italian. How is that possible? Yes, it is. It doesn't matter how old you are. You just exercise your brain and the magic happens. Love your methods, AJ. Thank you. That's exactly right. Exactly right. Exactly right. I mean, look at Mr. Steve Kaufman. He's a great example. He's, I don't know how old he is. I think he's in his 70s now, still learning new languages. You just, you never stop learning. That's it. There's, if you don't have it, if you don't have this idea, right, this is the problem. I hate that word graduation. I really hate it. I don't, actually, I don't hate the word. I hate the mentality, the mindset about it, this mindset, because what schools give uh, kids is this idea, this belief that you graduate from school. Graduate means finish. Oh, I graduated from college. I have my college degree. I'm done. Education's over. Finally, I'm finished with education, right? It's this idea that it's, it has a starting point. Oh, it starts when you're five or something, kindergarten. And then there's in the end point, some kind of college degree maybe. And that's it. Well, guess what? That's incredibly stupid. It's completely wrong. First of all, learning starts as soon as you're alive, right? Babies learn a huge amount. You probably did most of your biggest learning in terms of amount of learning for your brain. You probably did it in your first five years. You went from almost nothing to speaking fluently and walking and, and eating food, and right? That's pretty amazing, the first five years. So that's all before school. And then this idea that you somehow finish, this is such a tragedy. Okay, if you finish at 22, let's say you get a bachelor's degree, 22 years old. Most of your life is still ahead. If you live to be the average, I don't know, 77, 80 years old, you still have almost 60 years, possibly more, of your life. Are you going to waste 60 years and not learn? You're going to stop learning for 60 years? It means out of your life, only, you know, you only, you only learn for about 16 years of school. And then all the rest of the time, you're not. That's crazy. You just, you just keep learning. You just keep learning. You follow your curiosity, whatever. You just let it go. Like this woman, her student uh, or friend, wanted to go to Italy, lived in Italy, learned Italian. It doesn't matter. 65. It doesn't matter if she's 65 or 20 or 5. or it doesn't matter. You keep learning. As long as you're alive, you're still learning, 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 learning. And when you have this mentality, you suddenly realize, that this is why there's no need to panic. There's no need to worry if you're bad in school. It, it doesn't matter because that's such a short time of your life. That's from age 5 to 22, something like that, right? Kindergarten to you know, 16, that's like 17 years of school. That seems like a lot, but even if you do badly during those 17 years, you still have 60 more years, okay? So you got a lot of time. Even if you just, your 20s, right? That's that's 10 more years. So there's eight more years from 22 to 30. So you easily can keep going. It doesn't matter if you had a hard time in school or what they said about you in school. It doesn't matter. Not important. Uh, cricket is very popular in India, I know. Hello from Glasgow, Scotland. Uh, oh, here's from, um, 
Arif Hossein. Oops. Sorry. Hi from Bangladesh. Hello. College nowadays, students don't learn naturally, practically. How can they gain real knowledge? Ah, real world. Well, you got to get out in the world. You get out in the world. That's how you do it. How do you gain real world knowledge? Well, you do things. You get a job. You start a business. You travel around. You volunteer. You just do projects. Right? You do things out in the real world like everybody else, like all the other adults are doing. That's how you do it. You got to do. Right? It's, school is all about, it's kind of passive. I'm going to read and learn. Some reading is good, but for real world, you got to also do. You got to do. You got to get out there and try things and do things. And you might make mistakes. Probably you will. You might fail at some things. Probably you will. But that's how you get real world living and learning. And the good thing is, see, in the real world, you go out and you do something. And this, this kind of motivates you to learn more. For example, you want, let's say you start a business. I'm going to start my own business. And you start a business. Well, guess what? When you start a business, you become very motivated, super motivated to learn about business. Right? I know when I started my business, I was reading business books, probably two per day. Huge numbers of business books. I would go every day to the bookstore and read books. I was poor, so I would read the books and put them back, kind of like the library. Um, I was just reading, 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 reading. I was super motivated to learn all about business because I was actually doing it in the real world. And so now this knowledge, these, this book knowledge became quite useful. And then I would try things in the real world too, right? So very important, very important. Um, I, overall, in fact, I'd say even for kids, it's important. You have a for all education to have a, a combination of doing things out in the real world and study. If we go back to the science example, like um, Sabak was saying about, let's say, biology. So, okay, there is the, there's the reading the books and all that stuff about biology. Even, you know, some of the, maybe the laboratory, that kind of typical school stuff where you cut the frog open. Although, I don't know how useful that is. So, it's so, so useful, I think. Far more useful about biology would be get out in the world and look at living things. Study living things out in the real world. Not just some dead frozen frog, but I mean, get out there and look at living creatures and study them, observe them, take their pictures. Um, I don't know. There's... Millions of things you could do as a children or adults. Then it's, it's living real world stuff. Same with physics, right? You could go out there, observe the real physical world. Uh, Richard Feynman talks about this in his book, by the way. Great, great book. It's called Surely You're Joking, Mr. Feynman. Right? Great physicist. He talks, he hated school physics education. He's got some good chapters in there about how much it's how terrible it is and he talks about exactly this too he says one of the big things missing from science education and uh, specifically physics was there was a no connection to the real world he's like the the better way to learn physics is let's say for uh, anybody you go out and let's say you go and you notice something in the real world like oh, something simple let's say you go out you look up the sky is blue this is a common question from kids. The sky is blue. Real world. Why is the sky blue? I don't know. Well, now you're motivated. This is the real world is giving you motivation. Let's go find out. Why is the sky blue? You go, you start reading, uh, you read a bunch of stuff about physics and how the light comes in and it reflects and it gives you an explanation from physics of why the sky is blue. But that's still, you know, it's kind of an idea. So the next step, you could possibly try to do some kind of experiment with glass or prisms or light to really experience this um, phenomenon, right? This, this, uh, this thing that happens with light as it hits different surfaces or different um, kinds of air, right? basically the atmosphere for the earth and how it can break into different colored lights and it, you know, all this stuff, right? But the motivation is coming from the real world, the real world. And then you're trying, you're, you're trying to figure out, you're learning physics, but the starting point is something out in the real world, not a textbook. This is what Feynman was saying. This is where, um, school science, he said was bad and 
this is what we need in real science education is more exploring of the real world, noticing, observing the real world. Let that be the motivation for then figuring out, right, the, all of the more advanced type physics things. AJ, don't leave Facebook and YouTube. They're going to go bankrupt if you do that. Huh? Well, YouTube's kind of shadow banning me already. Ciao from Italy. Great, Giuliano. All right. I think it's about time to go. Okay, we're going to get one more long comment and then uh, it's time to go. Our last big long comment from Min again. Min Tron. Um, relating to this book, I want to thank you. You've changed me a lot. Uh, when I was in grade 10, I only did grammar tests in school. One day, I took a holiday with my family. I saw a couple, one Vietnamese person and one native English speaker. They chatted together and they laughed a lot. I asked myself, how could she do that, the Vietnamese person? I tried to figure it out. I searched on the internet and I saw you, Effortless English. I loved you at the beginning because the methods, um, your methods are totally different from the way I learned in school. I felt a big change in myself when I followed your methods for two months and my friends were very surprised. I was so happy. And I keep following your methods now. So I felt like, what you think, I feel exactly like you do too. Well, thank you. Wow, that's great. That's a wonderful story. You know, this reminds me of something I've been saying in my podcast, how just by doing effortless English, just by improving your English speaking, just doing that for yourself, right? Just focusing on your own um, improvement. You are actually being a leader for other people. And, you know, like how, right? If you're not, you're not trying to tell anybody about effortless English, you're not trying to teach anybody else English, you're not saying anything to anybody, but just your results might motivate someone else, might inspire somebody else. And that way you have a positive effect on other people. Like this girl, this woman, that he mentions that, you know, he's just, uh, she had no idea probably. He, he, she, she probably didn't even know he, he was listening or watching. But just by her talking to her friend or the guy or whatever, she inspired him. Just her example inspired him. See, you also, you may be doing this now or in the future. Just your example of speaking English, of enjoying English, might inspire others, right? And, and not only that, even more than English, just your example of being an independent learner, a lifelong learner. You know, you might have a very positive effect on people through your whole life just because of that. I mean, imagine a lot of people suffer from school. I, you know, I think, I think in general, effortless English attracts a lot of intelligent people and a lot of people who do fairly well in school which is fine, which is good. I did very well in school too. But um, but on the other hand, a lot of people don't do well in school. They get bad grades and they, they, they fall behind and they get labels and people tell them. I mean, people, I, again, I talk about today's podcast. The, the teachers never say stupid, at least in America. They never say that, okay? Um, they, they're not going to say, oh, this kid's stupid. Um, they use some other politically correct words. You know, they... Um, De developmental disability. They have these long scientific sounding words. But but all the kids know the meaning. They know it means stupid. That's what it means. And so what happens is the kids that do get the bad grades, maybe maybe they're too much energy, maybe they're just bored, whatever it is. Maybe they just need more time for some things, some topics like reading or math or something. Whatever the reason, they get a label. They get called, oh, I'm bad in school. I'm not good in school. I'm not good in English. I'm stupid. 
and then the other kids sometimes they notice too and they might bully them a little bit you're stupid and this can cause people to suffer for life it's not just school because they get this belief in their mind this idea in their mind i'm not good at learning i'm stupid i'm not good at english i'm not good at whatever but it's not really true it's just the schools right it's not true they they can do it maybe they're a year behind or two years behind it doesn't they got a lot of time if you learn for life well, so what two more years then you then you're the same as everyone else it's no big deal two years is short right so this is the thing you can be you can show people lifelong learning and help these people change their mind no i'm not stupid i'm not bad at english the schools were bad the system was bad i was bored at the time whatever doesn't matter because now i can keep learning i'm going to keep going it doesn't matter and eh, the grades doesn't matter those test scores who cares i'm going to keep learning i'm going to keep learning i'm going to keep going i'm an independent learner lifelong learner not stopping now, you can look in look in the world of business a lot of super 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 rich people very intelligent who started some great big giant companies they dropped out of school they quit school okay einstein's a famous example of somebody who was bored in school and did badly in school i think they kicked him out actually there are plenty of examples of this just keep learning that's all right so i hope you will do this keep learning and then you can be an example for many other people so they can kind of heal this idea, change this idea in their mind, and just keep learning, and they're going to be fine, okay? Okay, time to go. Woo, long show today. Hour and 45 minutes, wow. Maybe I'll wait, do the, I'll add the audio podcast tomorrow, probably, tomorrow morning for me. So it's not too much at one time. Okay, hope you enjoyed it. I enjoyed talking to you. Great topic, fascinating, great, powerful book, really, powerful book. We'll do the next chapter next week. Of course, new audio shows every day. Follow my audio podcast. You must. And last of all, join my VIP program. Join my VIP program at EffortlessEnglishClub.com. Join today at Effortless English Club.com. See you next time.